Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We're your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to the I Create Daily podcast, a movement for creators serious about their art. I'm Leora. And I'm Devani. And today we're joined by a husband and wife team, author team, and Sherry Fink and Derek Taylor Kent. I will read their bios separately. Sherry Fink is an inspirational speaker, a number one best-selling author, award Right. Number one best-selling and award-winning author and the president of the whimsical world of Sherry Fink Inspirational Brand. She creates books, products, and experiences that inspire and delight kids of all ages while planting the seeds of self-esteem. All five of her children's books were number one bestsellers, including The Little Rose, which was a number one Amazon bestseller for over 60 weeks. Congratulations. Yeah. Became the number one top rated children's ebook on Amazon and was adapted into a stage play. That's Whoa. awesome. Yeah. And Derek Taylor Kent is an author, screenwriter, performer, and director based in Los Angeles. Best known for his children's books, his best selling, award winning books are treasured in hundreds of thousands of homes across the world. His newest middle grade novel, ages seven to 12, Principal Mikey was released in May of 2018 and became a number one Amazon bestseller. He and his wife, author Sherry Fink, are the founders of Whimsical World, an empowering children's brand that publishes books and produces whimsical merchandise, inspiring entertainment and magical experiences for children of all ages. Welcome. Welcome. What a great name, Whimsical World. (laughs) Thank you. We're excited to be here. Yeah. And look at you. So for people who are listening and not seeing, you're missing Sherry's beautiful purple hair and glitter sequined eyes just all made up. So <laughs> we're going to get into that. We're going to get it because, because you write eyes. <laughs> <laughs> your, your eyes are great too. <laughs> your eyes are great too, Derek. Well, let's, so let's start with, we're going to get into all of your, your caricatures, your characters and your makeup and costumes and all that, but take us to the beginning. And it, with you guys, it's going to be a little interesting and you'll have to weave it in how best works for you as far as who's telling what story first, because you started out individually and now you're doing it together, right? So just tell us how you began your creator's journey, uh, becoming a children's author um, and then working, collaborating on it together. Okay. Well, you can tell your story. Okay. So I've always wanted to do this. It's so funny. It's like I'm living my childhood dream every day because oh. when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a writer, a teacher, a mother, a princess, and a mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of had the perfect job for all those things. <laughs> so I, I always was very creative. I, I was writing uh, ever since I could hold a, a pencil. I was trying to write stories and I was always telling my mom, write this down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I had dreams of doing it, but I, I grew up in a tiny town in Virginia and no one, I, I never known any authors and no one I knew know any, knew any authors. So it was kind of like this big, crazy dream. And I lost touch with it over the years. I, I think as most of us do, we get responsible. And, yeah. you know, I, I was the first person in my family to go for, ever go to college. And I climbed the corporate ladder. I got a master's degree. I did some business management programs. And I did all these things that, like, put me on this trajectory that was, um, from what it looked like on the outside, very successful. But it wasn't nurturing my soul. It wasn't something that I felt like I was making a big positive difference. Of course, in the the lives of my clients and and on a small scale, yes. But I felt called to do something bigger and I didn't know what it was. So during the time when I was at the top of the ladder that was against the wrong wall, I was doing a lot of soul searching and I had a gift of adversity where a woman in my office was bullying me. Mm -hmm. It was heartbreaking. I didn't know what to do. I've I've always been like kind of like the cheerleader girl, like for everyone. And I feel like we can all be successful and we can all like do these amazing things. And I didn't understand. So I was trying to deal with that. And 
I, I tried everything and nothing worked. And I was driving to work one day and I just had this like complete sense of surrender. I was like, I will do anything except run away to make the situation better. Yeah. Help me. And I don't even know who I was talking to at the time. I had never meditated. I, I wasn't in touch with my spiritual side at all. I was very cerebral, you know, very logical and rational. And that's how I had been conditioned to, to be successful. So this story came through me in the car on the way to work at stoplights about a little rose that grows up in a weed bed. And because she's different, thinks that she's the weed. Hmm. And it wrote through me. And I didn't know what it was. I put it away for more than a year, but I made a decision that day that I would be doing something else a year from then or working for someone else. Or I would do, do something different. And through a series of other serendipities, I am having a random conversation over a year later. And it led me to publish my first book, which ended up being a number one bestseller, like you said, for a very long time. And it enabled me to reach kids the way that I always wanted to. Mm. and required a lot of me of being brave and telling my story in the process, but helped change it for me. It changed my life. And then I had another idea and another idea. And I think what ends up happening is when you're on your path, like when you step forward in faith, like magical things happen, including meeting my soulmate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause you guys only got married about a year ago, right? right. We're about to yeah. celebrate our anniversary. All right. Fantastic. Congrats. Yeah. Congrats. Okay. So you guys met, you were already a published author, right? Um, okay. Sherry, you were a published author. Okay. So Derek, what is your author story? Uh, I've always kind of been a writer ever since I was seven years old. I, I just knew it. I was the kid in class who would stay inside during recess and lunchtime to finish the stories that they started during creative writing time in class. And I used to read the dictionary for fun to learn new words <laughs> that would stump my teachers. <laughs> and I just kind of always was known, like I was the writer guy, but I was also just into anything creative I was into. I was into acting and filmmaking and screenwriting. And I ended up going to college for a theater where I was doing both acting and playwriting. But back when I was in high school, I had become randomly re-obsessed with Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I kind of rediscovered all his books that I used to read as a kid. And I was like, it was like a light went off of me. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to write kids books. I was really into rhyming and poetry. So I wanted to like take that skill and apply it to books like he did. Oh, they were very poetic and lyrical, but also I could use my imagination. I could just have them going like on the far off fantastical lands. Um, so that's what I started doing when I was 15 years old. I wrote my first children's book. And the whole idea I had in my head was that my mom was an artist and she worked for Disney and Warner Brothers and Star Wars. And, um, my, my plan was that she was going to, we were going to kind of collaborate forever and write all these amazing <laughs> illustrated books. But that didn't end up happening. <laughs> she could not finish a single book. <laughs> so um, I kind of put it away for a while also, I guess, and was like focusing more on acting. And I was working after college also at, um, kind of nine to five jobs, like eight to 7 p.m. jobs. <laughs> yeah. um, and kind of acting on the side to get my creativity out. And then I discovered Harry Potter. <laughs> and I was like, well, wait a minute. Of course, that's what I need to be doing. Chapter books that don't need illustrations or I'm not reliant on anybody else. Yeah. Um, but finishing my first book took years and years. Um, it was a long and difficult process to get like my story right and what I wanted to do. And, um, so I finally finished it and then it was like a couple of years of editing. I didn't really know about it, how to get things published. Um, and I was also working so much at the time. I didn't have time to like to focus on it, but I finally had like a little gap. I remember it was like a three week gap around Christmas vacation. I was like, okay, I'm going to put my full, full focus on this and see if it happens. I had this one book that was very similar to like Harry Potter chapter book. And I got help with it to help me, uh, put all the packages together to send them all out to agents and publishers. And after three works of full-time work, sending out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of packages, back then that's all you could do. You couldn't, you couldn't just email people like you can now. You'd actually send out hard <laughs> of full books out to thousands of places. It's kind of yeah. a big investment of time and money. Yeah. And out of that, I got 
an agent, <laughs> one agent made an offer after all that. After hundreds of them read the books and were interested, I got one that was willing to commit to me. And that book did not, uh, that I sent to him, they really loved, went out with it, did not get a book deal, but it came real close. And one publisher really liked it, um, where I was on the fence, but passed, but liked my title. I thought that I could do something lighter and funnier with it, because mine was kind of dark and kind of darker and more serious for like than what the title was kind of promising. So based on that bite, I just like put everything I had into writing something totally new. And in about one month, I wrote a whole new book. The other one took me like four or five years to finally get to a place where I was comfortable setting up. I wrote the next one in a month. Usually I'm a very fast writer. Like I love writing pretty fast. Um, but I, had to, I guess you have to get that first one done before it gets a lot easier. And so we went out with the new book after that. And then it was like, bam, like a week later, I had a three book deal with HarperCollins. Wow. And I launched my, um, my author career. I was like, oh, okay, I guess this is what I'm going to be doing the next at least several years. Cause I was <laughs> under contract to write a whole bunch of books for them. And that ended up, I ended up getting more deals after that. And with uh, Holt McMillan for a bilingual picture book. Hmm. And, but then what was most exciting is when we got together, we created our own company where we don't have to work with publishers anymore, but we can have total control and, and act as our own publisher. Definitely. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's a, I love both of those stories and you know, this very different journeys uh, to get to a similar place. Um, and so I wanna to touch back on Sherry, your, so, so children's books, there are a lot of authors, um, people who want to be authors, who think they could start with children's books because they're simpler, there are fewer words, there are fewer pages, right? But <laughs> to create a children's book with all the illustrations is so much more complicated and so much more expensive than to create a book like, like you were talking about, Derek, you realized you didn't have to wait for your mom to do the artwork, you could just write words you know and so so in a way that is definitely easier even though you write more words but if that's your thing so back to you sherry it's like you know that was a big process so how did you get going with that process and also i mean I, the other part of it is that children's books are perceived as being that maybe they should be less expensive because it's a children's book but you've got so much beautiful art in there so how does that all work out for you uh, well for me when i started i had no idea like i didn't know what to do <laughs> Right. I had been in the corporate world and I had marketed, I was in marketing, so I had marketed lots of other different types of products, yeah. but I had never done anything for myself and I certainly didn't do anything in the book world. So I feel like that lack of knowledge actually served me because I had no idea what the limitations were of the industry. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, well, I'll just run it like a business, like I do my old team, like I, I will just do it that way. Why wouldn't I, right? Yeah. So I was doing it um, very differently than most people thought about uh, being an author. And for the children's book, like I didn't even know it was a children's book when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. Actually, <laughs> I was having a random conversation with someone and we were talking about writing and I told her the story and she said, I just got goosebumps. You have to do something with that because my grandchildren need that message. Mm -hmm. And that's when I thought, maybe it's a children's book. And when I came back from that conversation, I pulled it out of the drawer after more than a year. And I sent it out to 20 people who either had children or taught in the school, like elementary school, or ran nonprofits for kids. And I said, could you just give me some honest feedback? And 18 out of 20 literally said to me, I got goosebumps reading this story. And I thought- I'm getting goosebumps now. Oh. <laughs> You're telling the story, yeah. Maybe I could do it. You know, maybe I could live that childhood dream. So I started researching and like, how do you publish a children's book? I didn't know anyone who had done that. And I started, when I was in the corporate world, I had helped a lot of people. Like I'm a natural connector. And like, if I know that you love this and that person makes that, like I would introduce the two of you because I think you'd be friends, right? And I never asked for anything. So when I had this- crazy idea and I knew I had to act fast because I would chicken out if I didn't I was like who 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 do I know that knows an author who do I know who knows a best-selling author and would you introduce me and I wrote like a little quick little blurb about me and my dream to help kids with their self-esteem and that's what I sent out to people and it was so surprising to me because so many people bent over backwards to introduce me to like second and third group connections right. and it, them, I would have a 15 minute, I'd ask for 15 minutes. And that was it. And I would be very strict about it unless they said, Oh, we can go over. You know, I want to be very respectful. And I said, could I please have 15 minutes of your time? 
to ask you a few questions about, you know, your success. And I would say, what did you do that worked? What did you do that didn't work? Based on what you know my mission is, what do you suggest for me? And based on what you've done now, what would you do differently? And then I asked them, if you know someone else that, <laughs> should I talk to somebody else that you know? And would you introduce me? And that's how I did it. I talked to 15 different authors. Um, two of them were kind of like, eh, nice try kid. Like maybe one day you'll be a bestseller. But I was like, I want to do anything. Anything I do, I want to do it with excellence. And I measured excellence at the time by being bestselling award winning because I didn't know any other measures. So I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to try to, I'm going to swing for the fence. Right. So most of them were very, very encouraging. And I learned a lot, but I stumbled a lot too, because I didn't have a plan lined up for me. Like I, you know, the first time when my birth, when my book first hit number one on the bestseller list, I was losing 1123 per book yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I didn't know what to do, <laughs> but I got better. Like as I realized over time, like I can really make this into a business. I got more strategic and I learned new things and I made new um, relationships and connections with, with printers and editors and every book that I've done since then, I think has been an improvement. Um, and now I've, I've just published my ninth book, which Yay. amazes me. And I just approved my 10th book <laughs> for next year. I held it in my hands already. I'm like, this is crazy. You know? so, so I saw, um, speaking of that, uh, I saw where you said you were writing a book a year, that that's your plan is to write and publish a book a year and that you guys were sourcing from China. I saw your um, opening of your one of your books that just got you just got it in from China so could you speak so, so I guess speak to sort of like I mean a lot of the things you just said are really helpful for aspiring authors um, and creators in general I mean all of that is, is in particular the concept of approaching it a little bit like a business because that's the thing that most creators don't want to do so you had that advantage uh, initially but at the same time it's not like any big mystery because you approach it strategically right like you said you contacted people who had already been where you wanted to go or already done it and asked them specific questions so can you elaborate on what you discovered are those answers your answers to those questions yes well for me i would say that you have to think of it as a business you have to think of yourself as the ceo of your own company and you have to make strategic decisions so like, even now, I won't make enhancements to the books that won't result in more sales. Like I, 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 I invest in high quality. I invest in um, art and like the production value. And if it doesn't align with any of those things, because those are the things that make a difference for me and whether I buy a product or not, yeah. then I don't, I don't do it. Um, I also won't do something that's completely from my head. It has to be, I have to feel very passionate about it. Um, and I think that's something that's very true for Derek too is that every project that we do, we feel, we feel really passionate about it and it's easier to talk about something that you care about. And yes. for me, it aligns with the higher mission. Like I really want to help people. I genuinely love meeting people and hearing that, you know, hey, this made me think a little differently or I discovered something about myself in this process and that enables me to be more brave about it. And from a business standpoint, like I just have this thing where I like to eat. So <laughs> I want to be an artist, but I also want to have a nice full life. And in order to do that, you have to make a profit. So back to what you had asked before about the price point. I think many times we underestimate readers. We underestimate our fans and we think, oh, well, they'll only pay $10 for this. But you're not selling, at least from my perspective, you're not selling a commodity or a, a book. You, what you're selling really is a transformative experience that can be shared between the reader and the child. You're sharing something that's, a, for, for my books at least, it's, it's the start of a conversation that has much deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. And what price do you put on that? Yeah. You know? So that's yeah. You yeah. have to communicate that. So yeah, so, so Derek, so your experience then, like are you still working, are you bringing your publishing now to Whimsical World or are you stay, staying with publishers, the mainstream publishers for your books? It depends on the book. Um, I think that some of my books might um, work better with publishers and some of them are better for Whimsical World. Um, and we have a very specific mission and message with Whimsical World, which uh, you were so nice to read in your 
intro where we're about inspiring, delighting, and educating children of all ages while planting seeds of self-esteem and high achievement. Mm -hmm. Nice, um, wonderful. Well, if I write a book that I feel like it really works with Matt in our world, then I definitely want to bring it there. Sometimes I might have a book that um, is more better suited for the publishers. For I think for the most part, I'm going to definitely I think my plan is to uh, do picture books through Whimsical World um, and then probably give most of my chapter books uh, to my agent to give a shot at selling them. But if it doesn't work out, I can bring them back. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 That makes sense. So how did you two meet? So uh, we so. met. <laughs> <laughs> we I love hearing the met story. <laughs> doing what we love. We were both invited to a school to do a school visit there. We were, uh, one of our friends, uh, his kids went to a school and he decided to invite all of the author friends that he knew to the school to uh, give presentations to the students. Nice. And so there's about 20 other authors in this big room. And uh, I guess we were kind of drawn to one another. <laughs> we, <laughs> we sat down at the same table. We were just talking before it was time to do our show. We were talking about uh, our books and our lives. and. She helped me with a wardrobe malfunction I was having. <laughs> <laughs> and I helped her <laughs> with a, because uh, uh, we were talking about how he loses our voices a lot. Sometimes they do three or four shows a day and they're very high energy. And you know, sometimes they don't even give you a microphone and you have to <laughs> yell for an hour straight. <laughs> but telling her about, oh, I have my secret little coconut water that keeps me from losing my voice. Uh, that's how we met. Um, we didn't meet up again until Comic-Con a few months later. Uh, we were both at San Diego Comic-Con amidst the sea of 100,000 people and randomly ran into each other. Like, literally, I ran right into him. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I, there's some, there's some destiny there because, you know, the same friend, the same school, then the same Comic-Con. No. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. That makes sense. How wonderful. What a, and, and that you get now, you're both full-time writers, full-time authors, correct? Yeah. So full-time writers. And okay. So, um, so you get to write together at home. Like, what is your creative process? Like, like, what are like, are you guys like, both morning people as far as you're writing both in the morning do you kind of write throughout the day like how does that look like for you our schedule is bananas right now <laughs> <laughs> we can relate he's <laughs> pushing to strike it any hour <laughs> and often does in the off hours but like yesterday for example we did we visited four schools we spoke to over a thousand people yesterday we did two shows, um, 400 and then 650, and, I mean, not 250 in the second one on stage. And then we did two meet and greets uh, at different schools that we'd already appeared at. And then we did a family night event where we did signings all night. And in the midst of that, preparing for this interview, to, later today we're going to Hollywood for another interview. Someone's flying in to talk to us. So in these times, it's very hard to squeeze in any kind of writing. But what we've been doing is trying to claim like a little bit of time. Like I marked um, January is a, a slower month for us as far as events go because people are traveling and schools are not quite back in session yet and there's weather, you know. So that's a really good time for writing. So we've marked um, a week and a half in January that's going to be dedicated to writing. So now I'm, I'm like seizing little pockets like three hours here or there, four hours on the weekend. Um, but it's usually... I, I don't have a set time. I'm not like an author who can like turn it on, turn it off. They're like, right for 15 minutes a day. I'm like, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> it's a fire hose or it's nothing. <laughs> you need chunks. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So now you mentioned some of the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Were you going to say something, Derek, about that? Oh, um, yeah. I think uh, to, to build on what she said, like to the, this year has been a big business building year. Like after we got married, we, created Whimsical World together. And this whole year has pretty much been about both creating and building and growing this business. Um, uh, so yeah, I use my typical day, I definitely write for like, I try and write a few hours a day that make me feel really good, um, either in the, um, at night or in the afternoons. But our schedule has been like this. It feels like almost every day. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's been a little bit tougher to find the writing time that I, um, 
that I used to have. I used to write like you know two three books a year and screenplays, a few a couple of screenplays, all that stuff. So I am looking forward to getting back to that in January. Yeah, but that being said, we've still published <laughs> one, two, three, four, five books that have been released since we got engaged, That's and true. we are working on one, two, three actively right now three others so fantastic the one i'm i'm working on which i didn't count because it's not that close yet but what's the slow writing here (laughs) (laughs) relative to us but not for other people yeah we only came out with four books in the last year that's really bad so five books so 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 you're definitely so so tell us a little bit about the uh events that you attend um now, are any of them paid or all of it's marketing and PR? Oh, a lot of them are paid. Okay. Um, sometimes, well, a lot of times they pay us. Sometimes, like for Comic-Cons, you pay to have an exhibitor booth there. Right. right. More on the events we do. There's so many different kinds. That's what's great about being an author is that, you know, your, your audience and eager new readers are, they're everywhere for you. Um, our, our main, I think, streams that we like to do are schools. Um, and typically schools will, you know, they have author fees, um, that they, that they'll pay. pay Yeah. They pay you. And then, you know, to do shows and do signings afterwards, all those, you know, sometimes schools just don't have the money and you don't want to deprive them of the experience. So you can also donate your time to special instances. Um, we do, we do a lot of charity events too. Yeah. Uh, book festivals are, are great. Obviously you know, we do a lot of children's book festivals and book festivals all over California. Um, comic conventions we found to be a surprisingly great place. <laughs> we love, we, we, we like to do events where we would attend naturally. Yeah. You know, this is where we would go, where we would make friends like on a natural basis. Like those are organically correct places for us. Yeah, museums and children's museums now have become a big thing. Yeah. You know, there's children's play spaces where they, they've been having us come and doing story times. Mm. We just had this great one right by, on the ocean where there's a, it's a marine museum, uh, but they had decided to have a local author's event. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had books that are, teach kids about the sea life and how to count and with using sea life. So we got to go there and uh, meet all the people who would just be at the museum. <laughs> we, we also do um, speaking at writers' conferences, yeah. and I do keynotes for women's empowerment groups and organizations, and I love doing that. Um, and then sometimes we do our own events. So like a few weeks ago for the release of, let me see if I have it, The Little Unicorn, the new book, <laughs> we actually did um, a release party at a local mall mm. in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And 500 people showed up wow. and 100 were in line an hour before the store opened. Oh and that's a big deal when little kids wait for you. Like it yeah. made me cry. The go- when I saw the line, I was just like, oh my gosh. No kidding. Now, dude. That's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. So do you think that that was primarily, like, how did that happen? Yes. How did you get 500 there? How did you get them to wait online? Is it that they're already... Uh, fans of your previous books did you do some phenomenal marketing in advance how did that work you know we did a lot of things and I I think um, I think it's a combination of factors I think one is that I've been doing this for eight years and so has Derek so we kind of come together like we've been building 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 and then we kind of combined our fan bases you know they would if they like mine they're gonna like his and vice versa and we also partnered with um, the owner of the store and she already had a fan base of her own in that area and I used to live there. So this was South Bay, Los Angeles. And I was in Dancing with the South Bay Stars there. I raised money for a lot of charities there. So I had a lot of, um, a lot of goodwill going into it. But the thing that really shocked me was that there was a lot of new people, a lot of people that I had never met before. They didn't have any of my books. And I know because they told me, like, I'm so excited that I discovered you, you know? Um, so I think it was a lot of word of mouth coming from people who did already know us. And then we also listed the event on Eventbrite, and we'd never tried that before. Mm-hmm. So we used keywords like free unicorn party for kids. Mm-hmm. And then we had an amazing um, poster made for it, and we had it placed out in front of the store for a week. 
And we also use that in our social media and the social media I've been building for years. So we have a lot of, um, I'm sorry, our dog is here. No worries. We've got our own wandering around it's here too. You want to be in the interview? He's <laughs> tapping my shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Okay. Here he is. Yeah. <laughs> he has to be in every interview and hug the spotlight as usual. <laughs> Uh, so two of ours are away in the mountains today. We only have uh, one old girl here, so she's pretty mellow. Otherwise, we would have hours interrupting, too. Oh, really? But we love it. So, yeah. He's like, I help write the books, too. <laughs> Here's our inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. We actually have a new one. We have our brand new premiere party mm -hmm. coming on, uh, or was November 10th. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. um, celebrating our new bilingual doggy book. We love writing doggy books. Yeah. Awesome. Instead of Noel. Yeah. Doggy claws. That's my I love dog books inspired by this, by this guy. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? What did you say? I write a lot of bilingual dog books inspired by, by this guy. So are you, uh, so store, you're bilingual? A series of books. So are you bilingual or are you having someone translate for you? Uh, I actually studied languages in, in school for, I, took years of Spanish, Italian, and Latin. <laughs> um, I didn't, they, I kind of uh, haven't kept it up as well, but I'm able to do kind of rough translations when I'm writing, so I can, I plan things out, so things will rhyme in Spanish a lot. Um, so there's all tricks like that. Uh, but I do, then I, I always make sure I get help from someone who's <laughs> a little bit more fluent than me to polish it up and make sure it's all right. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense, that makes sense. So. Um, I, I like your point about how basically you both have about eight years into it. And, you know, I love the point about going to events that you would go to, go to, you would naturally go to anyway. And in particular where you guys are in Los Angeles, right? Yes. There's always something. Always. You, would, you would be going crazy, keeping yourself frantic, you know, always doing something, right? So it makes sense that you're selective um, based on the things that you resonate to, as well as the things that the audiences that would resonate to your work. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's just such a good point about, you know, you didn't start eight years ago, you didn't start out where you are now. No, you know? not and at so all. it's been a journey and it's been a, and, and, but what it sounds like most of what you're doing is you're putting yourself out there. You're doing lots of events. Um, you do free events first and that leads to paid events probably. Um, and so, so anything else you can say about success story, um, but, and then I want to come to your uh, printing in China and all that and how that's working out. But yeah, so any other like success tips, like of all the things you do, um, which ones, like what are the top two to three most productive things for you, either in revenue for the event or in what it leads to for your book sales? I would say creating new product, super important, because if you don't have something new and exciting, then people who've already hired you to come have nothing new to share with other people. So new product and lots of events, because there's, there's no substitute for making that in-person connection. Um, I mean, internet is amazing, and, and we have fans all over the world that we'd love to hear from, but... When you meet someone in person and you, you can feel their energy like on a live basis, it's, it's just so different and we love it too. And I don't know, it's, it's, maybe it's not completely scalable, but I don't care. Like I, <laughs> it's my favorite, it's my favorite and it's more work. And most authors as introverts, we like to hide behind the computer. But what I have learned over and over is that you can't do that. Like you, you have to be your authentic self and you have to be, allow your heart to be open to the world because that's what people will fall in love with. And if you hide it, you don't give them the opportunity. So it's not really about the books. It's really, for me, it's about creating a magical, memorable and meaningful experience in everything that we do. And I think that's why so many people came to the event because we're not just doing a boring book reading. I was a mermaid corn <laughs> and we had, a face painter and a bubble show. And I did two readings so people didn't have to be there the whole time. And we had unicorn cupcakes and we had amazing gift bags with sponsors that donated things for the kids. And, you know, it was a, it was an experience. And yeah. that with the, with the doggy claws party, we've hired a Santa to come. Kids can get their picture with Santa for free. You know, we have all these um, value added things that 
like I, w- I want to create events that I want to go to that I would actually move something off my calendar to go. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's the goal for me. And what do you think, honey? What do you think? The secret of our success? There's a, there is no secret to the success. <laughs> it's, it's, it's working. It's the hard work for years and years and years that you put into it mm-hmm. every single day. You're waking up thinking about it, what, you know, what you can do that day. Now we have, we've come up with, we're experienced now that we have like, we can plan it all way in advance now, but at the beginning, you don't know what you're doing and what's going to work. Yeah. And we've luckily found like things that, that do work for us, but it's doing the writing, you know, putting the work in before you do the writing to make sure the writing is good and people will like it <laughs> and want to keep, uh, and want to become your fan, a you know, lifelong fan. Oh, good. There's another doggy. Yeah, there's yeah. One. Ah! <laughs> this is Zoya. Uh, <laughs> she's 13 and can't see very well or hear very well but she uh, she loves to get around and explore so anyway she's joining us yeah that makes so much sense and i love that it reminds me of the malcolm gladwell tipping point you know yeah. ten thousand hours kind of concept you know and derek it's like what you were saying you know you wrote for years and didn't really get very far with that book and then you did it in a month so really you didn't in a month because it was supported and by mm-hmm. all those years yeah, of- i felt like i was doing nothing but struggling and writing constantly throughout my entire 20s yeah. <laughs> you know, without, with nothing to show for it, never getting paid to write anything you know for anything at all and then suddenly i hit 30 <laughs> and i get the book deal now it's like i can't stop you know now it's everything you do is just it's you know ways of you know whether it's like revenue, but really getting your stuff out there and making people happy and getting people actually reading your stuff and changing people's lives and making them happier. Yeah. 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 And I love the experience base that you guys focus on because I think like, like you were saying, uh, when we're so into like the screens and the doing the stuff on the screens and while you can form amazing connections on the internet with people, again like especially when you're trying to make connections with children and help them in a critical stage of their growth it is important to have like those role models that you can say hey i met that person and the thoughts that they shared and the stories they told and the experiences that they relate helped them in their growth especially in the younger children age where they're making those impressions and they're making those brain connections with with books and stories and what they experience yeah and it matters like more and more i'm realizing i'm about to write an article about it about representation matters yes i've had two incidences in the last month that really underlined it for me one was we we went to a school as we do almost every day and we did a visit for 300 students and afterward one of the teachers came over to me and she said i just want to thank you Because out of the 28 years I have worked at this school, you were the first female author we've ever had speak. Oh, wow. And in the children's book industry, we're almost all female. Wow. How is that possible? And a friend of mine, he brought his little girls to one of my book releases a few years ago, and he recently wrote an article saying that he's a writer too, and his kids see him write every single day. But for whatever reason, it wasn't until he brought his two little girls to my party when they were like, I want to be a writer one day because they saw a girl doing it. Yeah. So it's so, it's, it's such an honor to be that role model. It's not something that I would have guessed like about being, but it's, it's such an honor. And it's something that, um, whenever I feel like, oh, I don't want to do my makeup today. (laughs) I don't want to drive all the way there. I'm like. When I get out of bed, kids believe in themselves and they go for their dreams. Like if that's not motivating, like nothing will be. Yeah, I <laughs> love that. So speaking of putting on your makeup and your beautiful <laughs> color that you have and the wigs that you have, so that's part of your production. So just elaborate on, on how that evolved and, and what it contributes to your events and things and your, you know, your characters and your persona. And Derek, if you have costumes, we want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I do. We, <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> we had a costume. He's like, blah, 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 my costume closet. And I was like, what? <laughs> I need a costume closet. <laughs> That's what I was in the theater. I collected all my, I saved all my costumes. <laughs> so, um, so for me, like, 
I never used to do colorfulness. That's what I call it. Um, but one day, I, my, a friend of mine who was very into wigs, she, like, we went to Beverly Hills, and she brought a wig for me to wear, and we decorated cakes, and we went to the movies, and, like, the whole day, I was fabulous, you know? <laughs> and I was so introverted and scared, and, like, I felt really, I didn't want to stand out, you know? And that day, people were like, hi, <laughs> hi. And people are normally pretty nice to me, but they were, like, super friendly and happy, and I was like, wow. And I even called my neighbor when I got home late that night. I was like, you have to come over here and see my hair. You know? <laughs> and like, wow, that is fabulous. So yeah. I posted on Facebook on my fan page and I said, well, I have my first PBS SoCal event tomorrow. Should I go brunette or Smurf Berry Blue? And what do you think they said? <laughs> Berry Blue. <laughs> and then I was scared. I was like, oh my gosh am I a woman of my word? Am I going to do this thing? What if PBS doesn't like it? Like, what if people <laughs> laugh at me? You know? And I was like, you know what? What the heck? Like, it was fun yesterday. I'll do it again. And yeah. I did. I had so much fun and more people wanted pictures and they were like, where are you going to be next? And what color is it going to be next time? And I was like, I need to try on some more wigs. And I did. I started trying them on and I was like, you know, I actually really like them and it saves me time because I have <laughs> really long hair. It's down to my waist and you know, it just takes a long time to like get ready, you know? So yeah. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's kind of become my thing. And I found this wonderful glitter makeup and it's just kind of been aligning. And I don't always wear costumes except for comic cons. Like I was doing cosplay long before this and I love it. So my compromise with Derek is if we work the events, I'm still doing it in costume. <laughs> I'll work. Yeah. I'm going to have fun too. Nice. <laughs> and what about your costumes, Derek? Are you, are you get, dressing up for the comic cons or for the show things that you guys do? Like you said, we put on a show, like you get hired by school to put on a show. Is that like any kind of performance or is it primarily performing in the reading? Um, I think it depends on the event. Mm -hmm. uh, for the comic cons, I do like to dress up sometimes. Sometimes I just like to, have the brand though. So like I'm very big on branding. So people make sure people always know who we are. Yeah. Just as it's in every world, read, inspire, repeat. So our mission's on there also. Um, so I'm usually either in costume or I'm, you know, in whimsical world mode. Uh, I used to have t-shirts that I, when I first started off with my series, Scary School, that's the one that got the, my first book deal. So I had 10,000 t-shirts made that said, I survived Scary School. <laughs> I feel like every kid who got a book would be able to wear the shirt. <laughs> yeah. um, so I've always been very minded on like, also like marketing, like your marketing and branding. I always right. thought that was very important. Yeah. Wait till you see what's coming next too. We have these crazy ideas. <laughs> and as soon as we have like the physical ability to execute them, oh my goodness, it's going to be <laughs> so magical. <laughs> what can you tell us? What can you tell us now? <laughs> Well, we basically, like, for our, our events, like Comic-Con and, and WonderCon and Imaginology and all these events that we're doing, like, we really want people to come, like, be attracted to the booth because it's very whimsical and magical, but to hang out there and do cool things and share it. Like, sorry, our dog is coughing. <laughs> <laughs> He's in Derek's lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's okay, yeah. Uh, you know, like Instagrammable experiences. Um, often I am a mermaid. You know? <laughs> yeah. Things like that where we're like, did you know when you woke up this morning, you were going to meet a mermaid? You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and it's, what's, it's wonderful that even though you came from a corporate background, more left, more left brain kind of thing that you've been able to, and I would imagine it sounds like what you're saying is by getting into character anyway, getting into the mm -hmm. wigs and all, it gave you permission to just let that creative side of you come out and flow to in person and not just onto the page. Yeah. And it's the funny thing is I've always been this girl. I've yeah. always been a sparkly unicorn kind of girl, yeah. but I held it back when I was the corporate robot and I was everything everyone else wanted me to be. And now I won't even accept opportunities where I can't be myself. Like yeah. mm -hmm. I just don't want to do that. If it doesn't align, then it's a no thank you. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of opportunities that will be, present themselves where I can be full, full, fully embrace who I am and help the kids do that about themselves too. 
Yeah. I think yeah. that's something like I didn't know early on in our careers that we could make that choice, but a part of being successful is being able to say no. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Uh, and, you know, relative to the time that you spent in corporate, um, even though it was a very tough time, it gave you val valuable training and experience. Mm -hmm. um, and like you, like you said, it basically taught you what, what the no was, what the big no was, what you yeah. knew you didn't, you knew what you didn't want to do anymore. And yet, meanwhile, you built, what you built now is partly on the foundation of all that, all those years. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And early on, a lot of the people that I worked with in the corporate world were my only fans. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because that was your list. That was just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, so Whimsical World is such a great name. And like mm -hmm. you were talking about for t-shirts, for products of all kinds, such as you've got the unicorn book, you have the seahorse book, perfect the for book. the rose book, perfect for making like stuffed animals and other things. What plans do you have along those lines? And, you know, then maybe you can also speak to that and get into um, sharing what you do with the sourcing of your books to China and that sort of thing before we let you go, because we're already over time. If you have a little more time to share all of that. Yes, we'd be happy to. So um, we've actually already started with merchandise and it's doing very, very well. Most of it we sell offline at events. But we have, I think, eight or nine, maybe 10 different button designs now. Um, like, you know, just the little buttons that kids wear on their backpacks or whatever. Um, we have unicorn headbands, mermaid purses. Uh, what else? Magnets. Magnets. Um, enamel pins. I'm saving that one for the last. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think that was the last one. Lip though. balms. I have fun flavored lip balms that have the characters on them and they're SPF 15 and all organic ingredients. And they, they're like watermelon, bubble gum, banana, like those types okay. of flavors yeah. um, that my fans picked. And then most recently we debuted enamel pins and those are highly collectible. Um, actually, I, oh, I don't, it's over there. And you're, yeah, never mind. Okay. So, <laughs> Check out our Instagram, you'll see them. But they're super glittery and they're amazing and they're highly collectible, like Disney pins. Um, and what we've been doing though is being very strategic because it's easy to grow too fast and not be able to sustain. And we are really big about running our company debt free. So we want to have the strong foundation and then build upon that because I think that will be a more fulfilling experience for us and for our fans. So we're doing it slowly, but there are more things coming. It's right. just a matter of when. <laughs> yes. Well, what I love so much is sort of like, yes, your brand is Whimsical World. And yes, it's about the unicorns and the mermaids. And it's like so fun and so cool. But you guys are very strategic and business minded. And there's nothing whimsical about how you're building it. You're building it. You're visioning it. You're manifesting every single day. And so your business side isn't whimsical, like which can be a thing with creators where we just like to get into the creative flow and forget, oh, if I want to make this a business, I need to do this in a strategic way. So I really love that. Thank you. Yeah, we learn every day. Yeah. Yeah, I had a I had a good example growing up from my mom who was an artist, you know, and kind of did whimsical paintings were her thing. She, you know, she'd do uh her name is Melanie Taylor Kent. If you want to look her up, uh, okay. you know, Disney, I told you, I mentioned like she did Disney commemorative paintings and Warner Brothers and stuff, but she was, became one of the most successful artists of the 20th century wow. um, running the business um, side of things. And so I, I kind of learned from that about how you can, you know, take something like that's really crazy when going to turn it into something big. And that's what I always wanted to do. And I found someone to do it with. <laughs> um, okay. So tell us about your publishing. Oh, yes. So we, when I was starting out and, and losing money on every book, um, because I didn't know what I was doing, I was like, let me learn from the successful publishers. Let me see how they do it. And what I discovered is that they mostly print overseas. And I was like, well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So then I started vetting um, printer quality for companies that, that I could order from. And I ended up finding an amazing partner. I've been working with them the entire time and referred a lot of friends and and fans to them who have dreams of writing books too. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, as I'm on my path, I need an editor. Oh, well, I like working with you. So I'm gonna start working with you regularly. You know, oh, I, I've been stumbled upon a, a wonderful illustrator. Like I'm gonna continue working with you. So it's just, 
it's kind of like um, super friends, right? You're going out <laughs> doing your passionate thing, and then you meet people, and you're like, oh, well, I totally resonate with them, and they got the business side dialed in too, and they're not going to screw you over because it's not a handshake deal, right? You have to have contracts. You have to have attorney blessings. You have to have all these things, and I didn't know all of that starting out. I was much more trusting and naive, um, but I've learned, and, and you have to – it's kind of like being a good parent. You want to be loving, but part of being loving is having healthy boundaries. And you have to set those boundaries for your business too. Like there have to be certain rules about the types of people that you'll get into partnership with and the types of people that are not a fit. And it just saves you so much time and energy and headaches later. So I think that for me has been my biggest learning is like, I only partner with people that feels good. Like it's got to feel right and make sense financially and professionally. I knew nothing about this before I met Sherry. <laughs> I didn't know that it was possible to make like a living independently publishing. Um, you know, I, I kind of thought that, Oh, like you, unless you're doing the traditional publishing, then it's impossible to make money. I, I used to talk to people at shows cause I thought I was going to have to do it for a long time before I got my deal. And I was like, and they were telling me how much they were spending. They were spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars just for the printing. And I'm like, Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> But no, like, but like Sherry actually went out and found all these other great ways. And But the great thing about now is there's all these other services where um, you don't have the means to warehouse and fulfill orders. Like we're kind of running a, bit, a publishing company. Um, then you can use uh, all these great services that have sprung up that do print on demand. So you um, don't have to you know, pay for that initial upfront printing like you used to have to do. Right. Um, so that's, it's great that nowadays there's so many other resources and you can build a business the right way. Even if you um, don't do it like we do it, there's other ways you can do it and still, you know, make a good living out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Sorry. I had to put the dog down. <laughs> it's okay. She, she was her father come home. <laughs> she wanted to go. Okay. So fantastic. Um, are you back to the, okay. So maybe we can, include a link to your connection and um, for publishing or printing books in China? Would that work so that, you know, or else actually we can just, which would you prefer uh, to share that link um, or that contact or for them to contact you and find out information? I tell you, it's, the company is MCRL Overseas Printing. Okay. MCR. And, and do they specialize in children's books or do they also print like textbooks? Everything. Text not okay. just books, they do game, like um, board games, they do packaging, boxes, they do everything. This is because, I don't know if you had any bad experiences, but, you know, it, it's so helpful to have a referral mm -hmm. because you don't know, you know, who you're but, connecting yeah. with there. there could, it could be someone who, it's not going to be a good fit or it's not going to be reliable. So it's very helpful to have a connection. Now yeah. we will only do business with people we have referrals from because, because of that exact thing, you're, you're investing thousands of dollars. Yes. And it's heartbreaking when it doesn't come out the way that you want it to. And I only Definitely. want to do the best and I want good people to work with the best too. So, Definitely. so are you selling your brand and merchandise on Amazon? All of our books are available on Amazon. Um, we are not selling the merchandise there. The margins just don't make sense for merch, uh, especially with the shipping. So um, most of that is sold offline, but you can get almost everything on our website, whimsicalworldbooks.com. And okay. that will be rolling in the coming year too. So you, it's something to think about. Are you sourcing your, most of your merch locally um, or in the U.S. or in China as well? It's in the U.S. Okay, because that, you know, your connection might be able to connect you with some manufacturers for some of the merchandise because since you're building a brand and you're building a large brand this multifaceted um, it's just a natural extension for you to be able to to build a large e-commerce store as well around that you know and fantastic brand name you already have some of the items so I would you know I would think take your best selling items that you know it from the shows and that sort of thing and then begin to source it uh, from China or from good places in the US um, and, you know, as far as the price, kind of like what you said about the books, well, you know, if you do source it in the U.S. and the price has to be higher in order to sell it, you know, it's still your branded merchandise. So, you know, your moat is not price. Your moat is your brand, you know, and the following and the, you know, so, so that's something that might help, you know, be a part of your, your bigger vision as you grow. And we do a lot of, we do a lot of things too, like 
a lot of YouTube interviews. We do a lot of Skype visits. We do, we do a lot of um, charity events and things that benefit people of all different um, social economic strata. So I think it's, um, I think it's important as artists to embrace that our work has value mm-hmm. and you can choose to donate that, but you don't always have to, you know? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, do you have any other thoughts you want to share before we go and let you go on, you know, where your vision is or any other things that you think would be helpful for others and anything about your books that you'd like to share? I would just say everything is possible. You know, mm-hmm. like I'm doing the things that I dreamt of doing when I was a little girl. Mm-hmm. Like, that's amazing. That. That's yeah. Amazing. We had this moment, like we had, um, we had this amazing video created that's about how, because we, when we first formed Whimsical World, we wanted a way to communicate to our fans that like, this is Derek and oh, and this is Sherry. And like, here's where we came from and here's where we're going. And this is what Whimsical World is about. So we had this really incredible little video, like less than a minute made, little trailer. And it still makes me cry when I watch it. And yesterday, Derek had the great idea to show it to the kids so we're on stage, there's 400 kids in the audience, and the lights go down, and the movie plays, and I am, like, backstage <laughs> weeping. <laughs> oh, please don't have them me speak next. <laughs> I've dreamt of that, like, that type of a moment since I was a tiny child. Wow. And it's taken a while, but it's coming, and now it's coming faster than ever before, and we're trying to just ride the wave and, and slow and steady growth, and always be humble and grateful, you know, because it's our fans that, that put us into a position where we can create more work and more books and, and express ourselves. And as long as that is fulfilling and we're having fun doing it, like that to me is like the ultimate definition of success. Yeah. So, that's, everything's possible. <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing mm-hmm. summation. How about you, Derek? Anything final to say before we let you go? Well, I think if they're watching this, they're doing the right thing, you know, mm-hmm. like you're, you're doing the, the work and the study and the research required um, to in order to be successful. So you're already in the right place doing the right thing. So if you're able to get the, the writing done the part, or the creative side done and you're, and you're now doing the, this business research of it, like you're on the right track, you know, mm-hmm. keep doing what you're doing and, uh, a lot of times you can also seek out mentors to help you too. Like I know Sherry has mentored a lot, over 50 uh, mm-hmm. authors now to help publish their books and become bestsellers. Um, so you can find someone like Sherry or someone else who can uh, mentor you along the way. That's also uh, another great step to take. Fantastic. Nope. That makes a lot of sense. You guys have both summed it up really beautifully. Um, and, you know, thank you for the beautiful beauty and positivity and magic you bring to the world. Um, and we'll definitely link to your uh, Amazon store and books um, in this interview um, article so that in the show notes so that people can find you. And we look forward to following you, continuing to following your unfolding vision. Likewise, thank you for what you bring into the world. Like we creatives, we we need a way to connect with each other because a lot of times we are isolated and doing our thing. And yeah, really important. And I love that you're doing it in nature. I saw your Instagram post this morning, like the butterfly just floating by. I was like, oh, I wish I was in that space right now. <laughs> I love that, you're, that you're not only doing this, but you're doing it your way, and that's very inspiring. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, guys. All right, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.